Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, previously known for Sinless, now coming out with its first proper exp expansion slash module in Billionaire Bounty, the one and only Courtney Campbell. No soup jokes, please, and no soup for you. How are you doing today, man? Uh, I, I mean, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. I... I may have I may have used the soup joke last time, but I couldn't help myself. No, no, I don't. I don't think you have. Uh, it helps people spell it. <laughs> but so with with billionaire bounty, I suppose I suppose the first thing to start is that it, you've called it a trove of quick start tools. So is this something that's halfway between a module and a expansion? Yeah. I, well. I think when I was here last year and I ran Sinless, it was it was something I had been working on, but it was an idea. And in the year since then, that has gone from an idea to a concrete novel product. And the problem with novel products is that uh, they're new, right? They're intimidating. People don't have a framework or a reference for how to understand it. They may understand all the individual parts, but there's a synthesis in putting it together. And Sinless is doing something um, unique, original in the tabletop space. And people who have played it, I, I, I <laughs> when people open the book, uh, you usually get a gasp. And then people are like, holy shit, this makes me excited to run a game. I can't wait to get this at the table. Um, and we've had relatively little errata and tons of positive feedback from play. And so what I wanted was I wanted a product that allowed people who were interested and wasn't sure that it would be something um, finished or good, that uh, now that it is, that they have a product that allows them to um, bring that to their table mm -hmm. and share that with their players in a way that's easy for them. Now, I live in the real world, and my focus is on actually playing a game with people. I, I don't know what everybody else is doing, right? But I, I've looked at the the structure of most role-playing, and I, I have to be honest. I don't generally find the grid uh, battle uh, in Pathfinder and D&D-style games very tactical. I also, uh, if you're not playing in an OSR game, don't find it very strategic. So I started um, from first principles, thinking about what is it I want this group of people to be doing at the table. And uh, part of what engages me in games is the concrete choice of upgrading and growth, right? I think that's why a lot of people like characters. Um, it certainly is a part of all the games that I play very frequently. I, I mean, my most popular product is on downtime and domain, right? Like, I love, I love having, you know, a castle. And, oh, we're going to upgrade it. We're going to add a wizard's tower. And that's going to give you access to these enchantments, right? Um, and when I'm playing a lot of cyber sorcery games, uh, my game is obviously an homage, a clone. I found... Um, that they leave all of that up to the DM to figure out because they're only focused on the action in play during an operation. And part of the issue with that is, is not only the incredible amount of burden and work it puts on the DM, it removes a lot of things I find valuable in games. Agency, objective decision making, uh, making sure that players have open and honest information and not doing like a deceit thing. Th having played thousands of hours of cyber sorcery games, I guarantee you more than 10 of them have been had in discussions about why they just won't get in the fucking car and go to meet the Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're in an environment where they don't have any agency and so anytime they give up some of that they feel like they're exposing themselves to threat and the game says don't do that and so it creates all these really unpleasant and difficult dynamics at the table 
to add on to it, um, the people who work on uh, mainline cyber sorcery games are really, really wonderful designers. I think like um, Eclipse Phase is excellent, but we know that they are very complicated, right? Adam yes. Jury. They like to write complicated rules. Tom Dowd like to write complicated rules. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a problem with complication, but what I'm interested in is not building and trying to create like some sort of build, but in the moment at the table being consistently presented with interesting decisions. And with Sinless, I've created something that does that on multiple levels. And Sinless Billionaire Bounty is a sandbox along with quick start tools, uh, a base camp sane setting, so that you can just sit down with your players and in 15 minutes, have everybody excited about the game and ready to go and with a very good understanding of the complete flow of play and what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. So with the, I will note when you, when you first showed me the um, cover image for Billionaire Bounty, one of the first things that ended up coming to to coming to mind is the poster for the original Die Hard, and I'm one, I'm wondering if that's what you were trying to channel with that, or if that's just coincidence it's, on my part. So I want to be very clear about this. Sinless is a true cyberpunk game, mm -hmm. and what that means is is it's about the nature of humanity, your responsibility in the world, and and controlling the rights of corporations. Uh, you know, like there's animal uplifts and there's synths, and it, it is a true cyberpunk game. But I love retrofuturism. I know that's pissing William Gibson off, right? Like, I, I'm very sorry. Uh, I love magic. So retrofuturism and magic are in the game. My inspiration were the 70s disaster movie posters, right? Where the, the kind of thing the, that, airplane, that airplane was lampooning back in the day. Oh, well, yeah, well, like there was there was Airport 77 is the horror movie, right? It's about people in a plane that's going to crash. And, and like, so what you would do is you would take all these famous actors and then they would take frames of them in the movie when they're dying or whatever. And they'd put it on the cover. Mm -hmm. And and like that would be the pitch to the movie. Oh, we're going to watch someone so die. Well, look, the billionaires, they're not your friends. Nobody accumulates a billion dollars morally. That's the core that's one of the core principles of themes in Sinless is that you it's it's an inappropriate accumulation of wealth, right? Like when when Smog is the eleventh richest person in the world and he sits on a literal mountain of gold, you, you kind of have to accept that anybody who uh, accumulates that many resources and denies them from their peers is is um, what you might call uh, a, a dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. for the human creature, right? So these billionaires are not your friends. And so who better <laughs> to be pinions in a city that's under siege? You know, they can't get out. They all want to get out. And uh, much like the core theme of Sinless, you are the agent who determines, you know, uh, which ones you're going to use, which ones you're going to ally with, what happens. You know, I, I'm not... I'm not... Uh, there's no morality or any sort of it's very clear right that using subliminal advertisement to gain influence in a sector is wrong right mm -hmm. but i'm not passing judgment there aren't mechanical punishments it's a question of as it is always in sinless what are you going to do you're not limited you can choose how to respond to things um one of the things that has come up a lot in the playtesting for billionaire bounty is that Talented groups who are not looking to get their, you know, uh, groups shot up, manage to complete um, operations without, you know, getting shot at. Like, they, you can intelligently approach a thing so that if what you want to do is, you know, um, exert influence on a vice president instead of marching in there and stealing something, well, that's a totally valid approach. Mm-hmm. And within the within the um, setup that you ha that you have with bil with billionaire bounty, I I did notice that you made the conscious choice to use this to reintroduce how sinless works, like likely because this is for a lot of people this is going to be their first introduction to sinless. Mm -hmm. It's it, they're absolutely you're absolutely correct that mm -hmm. this is an onboarding campaign. I didn't have a product when I ran the original Sinless Kickstarter. So those 
thousand people that backed me. And it was like 800 plus, I forget. Um, they backed me because they believed in me. And now that people are getting it, they're opening up their books and they're like, holy shit, this is amazing. Like, the art is amazing. The rules are amazing. Like, it makes people immediately want to run games. I have people coming to my Discord every day. Are you going to run games? Is somebody going to run games? It's just, they're excited about it. And now that I have it, I think a lot of people were very dismissive because I was communicating to Shadowrun players. You know, this is the game I wanted when I opened up Shadowrun in 1994. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's what this is and Shadowrun has never been that for me um, and I realized at one point I am a game designer so here we are yeah <laughs> and and like the response is really positive and um, I, it is it is different than Shadowrun so, like there's a lot of people who are like well I don't want my magic in cyberpunk that's wonderful this isn't a product for them then. and then there are a lot of people who are like well I like the meta plot in Shadowrun and I'm I'm an OSR guy originally. I'm like the Forgotten Realms. Uh, we'll do things, you know, things will happen. Things happen in the billionaire bounty module, but I don't want people running games to be burdened with canon, trying to figure out what's right and what's not. What's right and what's not is whatever you're doing at your table. And so people who are just into the meta plot or people who don't like, this is not a product for them. But if that doesn't include you, this is, I think, one of the most novel and exciting RPG products released this year. It's not a rehash of uh, things that you've seen before. It's not a copy of anything. It is a genuinely new and exciting product. I, w- I would be curious to know how m- if if you were to if you were to do a ballpark estimate of how many people have been coming in to your to your server who are um, th- for whom this is their first time t- time dipping into this mixture of cyberpunk and, f- and magic at versus those who have a background in, sh- in stuff like Shadowrun already and are jumping in which would you say is the lion's share of that oh i'd say 98% of people have some sort of experience and dissatisfaction with shadowrun mm-hmm. i've gotten some people who are fans of mine uh, a couple times um, but not not the majority, no. But then um, it's it's the people who are wanting to see that you can run a sinless session in ninety minutes. It's mm-hmm. set up. It's like it was designed to be a game to be played with people. Like so, you can sit down with minimal prep. We're currently working on a mission generator, so you don't even have to take any prep between operations. You can just click the button twice Mm -hmm. and offer those two new missions in the pool of missions available to your players. It's really amazing. Um, They're individually crafted. It's not just random. It's like uh, we're building a database of hundreds of missions with, you know, different factions being switched in and out, allowing you to sort of, as a DM, also organically play and experience the world, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's in that short, uh, playable, sit down, have some fun with friends, and then it's got unity between sessions. One of the things I've noticed most with playtesting is that there are a lot of interesting choices in the sector phase. And so between sessions, they will plan out, uh, I've had players plan out three or four sector turns ahead, which is always entertaining because by the time the next sector turns around, they have a whole different set of priorities. Mm-hmm. Um, the sector activities work a lot like Ticket to Ride. You have a number of slots based on your size of things you can do between missions. And um, you can use your own skills or your brand's uh, abilities to take over or expand or build new resources that provide you benefits. Um, mm-hmm. Or you can use your assets, which are like the people in a cyberpunk world. We have a 120 high quality illustrations of assets that provide I'm going to say um, creative applications of force in a variety of areas. So these assets, you you hire them. They're like, you know, gangs or goons or mad scientists or people in a cyberpunk world, right? And they're your contacts. But instead of it being something vague and undefined, they have very specific abilities from, you know, I... I, uh, uh, making money by imprisoning people 
uh, Gordon Hand has, you know, prisons for profit or, you know, uh, duplicating another person or cloning another asset or, you know, enchanting somebody or a doppelganger taking somebody's place. They provide access to tools that are outside the realm of player ability. Mm-hmm. Now, with billion with billionaire bounty, you have it set up of, of having t- essentially twelve billionaires trapped in the city of Mammon. The way you have it set up, may, maybe I'm mis- maybe I'm misinterpreting, but it sounds like you're going for a bit of a um, sandbox like approach with that module. Of yeah, absolutely, the it is. It is. There's the setup, and just let people go with it. I I'm a I'm not a. Um, this is a classic game. It's not a traditional game. It's not 2E or Shadowrun style where the DM has a plot and they force the characters around it. It's a classic style game where you're in a world with other agents who have their own priorities. Mm-hmm. And since this is me- since this is meant to be kind of a launching off point for Sinless, do you do you plan on putting on putting in some, some guidance for? Helping, helping people get their particular agents inundated with um, with the city, whether it be a, whether it be a primer of the city, whether it be possible backgrounds or something in between. I I'm sorry. Can you I don't, can you ask that question again? I don't understand. Oh. Um, given that this is a launch, given that billionaire bounty is something of a launching off point when it comes to sinless. Are you planning within the, within the pages to put in a few a few examples or a few or a few primers to help people get in inundated with the city of Mammon? Oh, you mean as a as a setting? Yeah. So uh, we've talked a little bit about sectors. Mm-hmm. Uh, sectors are sort of like the map, right? Uh, you can think of it like a hex, but in a city. A sector might be a single floor on a arcology, or the entire arcology itself. It's flexible. Um, that was uh, a design goal of Sinless: is that we wanted um, our structures to be manifold and flexible. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we'll be providing a couple sectors, and they'll have factions and people in them. And like, I don't know what happens because the players get to decide. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's it's a, it, there's stuff there, and there's people there, and they can be like, th- there's going to be mission chains, um, and the whole project is to show you how to do this in a way that dynamically responds to player action. So yeah. you know, at the start of every operation, there's they search out missions, people that are hiring sinless to do their work for them, and um, there's going to be a variety of missions, and the outcomes of those missions affect the world. Like there's a specific phase for being for like handling that. Like what what are the effects of the mission that just happened? Right, we uh, identify it and separate it out. But also we're going to provide some mission chains to make it very explicit about how the players through their own decisions will find the world responding to them, which is pretty common, I think, in uh, a goal in video games. Like it's very much what Larian tried to do with Baldur's Gate 3 by covering every avenue. But uh, you you don't, as a human, you don't have to worry about what's programmed. You can dynamically adapt to what the players are choosing to do. And the tools are there to make that as labor free and easy for you as possible. Mm-hmm. I I can get that. Oh, for me. I mean, just to, for a specific yeah. example, like uh, I, I, we have a very clear method of how much a job pays, how you get paid, and what's going on in the contract, and what the contract evaluations are. Like that is very often something that you're given loose guidance for in a lot of uh, mission. Uh, based uh, cyberpunk, cyber sorcery type games. Mm -hmm. So like there are very, very clear structures that just handle all of the stuff most of these games expect you to do so you can focus on thinking about what's happening and responding to the players and pacing. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, for me, it's all about, it's all about eliminating um, analysis paralysis, which is something that can happen when you have a very free-form experience. 
Yeah, um, so that, that you're absolutely right. You get overwhelmed with options. And mm -hmm. when I say the tools are designed to help you do this with low work, what I mean is, is that they eliminate the option paralysis. I, I mean, it's there. You can see it. You can automatically generate one if you don't want to do it yourself. We're working on that, you know. And you can just decide and think about it because you're given uh, a limited constraint, which is the solution mm -hmm. to uh, decision paralysis. If you have something that sparks your own inspiration then it's a guide and not something you don't know what to do and anybody who's read the sinless rule book can tell you that it's just that it's just uh inspiration after inspiration after inspiration narrowing down and eliminating it's just not all things to all people mm. you know i i see i see a lot of people doing that i am making a cyber sorcery <laughs> game there are people that are interested in that and there are people who will not touch magic in their cyber sorcery. What this is, is this is the best game for those people. Yeah, that's, I can certainly get that. <laughs> now, with, with, that in, with that in mind, the, given the focus of 12 billionaires stuck in a, stuck in a city that's in, that's in the middle of an invasion, um, do you have, is there? Do you have plans on putting these these profiles for each of the billionaires and who um, their particular agendas? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's obviously a precipitating event that brings them all into town. They're all going to have relationships with everyone. They're all going to have secrets. They're all going to have their own agendas, and uh, they're all involved in some way with the launch of the Sigil chip. And like my players. Uh, for the most part, didn't interact with them a whole bunch until the actual event. And then they were like, holy shit, a lot of these people are assholes. There's 12 of them, though, right? So you get your pick. You get your version. And uh, one of the things that I think is very important for people running games is that they have a handle on it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when you look at the billionaire sheet um, for the example billionaires or whatever, you're like, I know exactly who this asshole is. Right. Like, you, 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 it, it's like you have a conception of them, right? We all know an Elon Musk or a, uh, uh, who's the, um, a Bernie Madoff, not, not pyramid schemes, but like, uh, you know, the, all the rich people, you know, they're different types of people and they have very clear characterizations. And I think that, um, uh, each one is used to examine different, cyberpunk themes right mm -hmm. and there's no there's no i just i am not the arbiter of morality like different people find different things acceptable so it is very clearly an anti-capitalist anti uh it, it, it's in the anti-anti dystopian space kim robinson wrote an essay about anti-anti dystopianism and it's uh, about maturation i think as a species and at a certain point you realize that dystopias aren't stable they happen but what happens to a dystopia by nature of it being a dystopia is that it it eliminates itself right mm -hmm. and so uh the idea of utopia is ridiculous for the same reasons that you know, people have been arguing about the existence of God. You know, what is good, what is best. You have to, at some point, make a judgment call that affects some people better than others. It's a complicated situation. And so instead of preaching morality or any type of thing, I put players in a world where they get to decide. This is, this is your, your choice. What is moral? What are you going to do? How are you going to justify it? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the choices you're going to make? It, 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 is, it is the... I think the most important part of a cyberpunk game is to not make the players the victims, but rather the agents of change. Yeah. Now, with th with that in with that in mind, uh, I know th I know that this is meant to be a sa meant to be a sandbox. But do you plan on putting any um, potential suggestions on how to exit the scenario? Okay, so yeah, uh, it's it's a campaign starter. Like uh, it goes up to the event where the city is locked down, and then the DM can, the the Agonarch can then uh, decide. They've been playing at this point for I don't know twelve to fourteen sessions, right? 
um, and they can say, well, you know, there's opportunities presented in the module. Uh, there's the space elevator you can exit the city through. That's one option. Uh, there's you can go through the sunken, so you can exit out through uh, flooded and decrepit areas of the city, or there's, there's some other options <laughs> that can be discovered in play, and certain things that can be opened up by the choices you make in earlier missions. You know, um, uh, but that is that is like it, 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 there was some discussion about that. You know, they can continue to run the game in the city. Or they can escape, and you can treat it as like a Fandelver, where it was their introductory scenario, and then you can set up your own city and have your own plots and ideas. Uh, it's it it's just a tool to let people sit down and start playing in a few minutes, <laughs> with lots of interesting choices and fun stuff to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get yeah. that. And and I, I know we've said sandbox, right? But in D and D, a sandbox is a lot of like, well, where are you going to go? You can go here, you can go there. This is less like a sandbox in the sense that uh, you just sort of decide what you're doing. Uh, the the game is structured into two different phases, right? The sector phase and the operation phase. And there's no lying to the players, but the players have limited information. The information is objective, right? Mm -hmm. And so. They use their actions to get information and affect change, and then that will give them more information and change the setting, and then they make new decisions. So when they finish with the sector phase, they go into an operation phase, and there's a list of operations. Each operation, of course, is tied into the events that are happening in the sectors and in the cities, right? And the whole point of the game is for them to generate this revenue. And so they take the operation. So it's not a sandbox in that there's a lack of direction. It's a sandbox in that there's not a predetermined correct ending. Yeah. But we shouldn't, I did not want, I, I love running sandboxes, but having done it many, many dozens of times, I did not want the, well, we're unmotivated. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. uh, the motivations are integrated not into character design, but into the theme of the very gameplay itself. See, because you, you take over the city. You, yeah. you own things in the city, and then the city is affected by what happens in it. So I don't have to do anything. It's your headquarters. Like, <laughs> right? Like, if, if somebody, you know, blows up a building in the sector where your headquarters is, and the sector gets locked down, and then you don't have any of your sector bonuses, you're involved, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's a sandbox. You didn't know that was going to happen. But, like, uh, you're motivated. You're not, what do I need to do? You know what you need to do. You need to, how, what, this is not okay, right? It's very motivating. Um, mm -hmm. which is, I think, why the players spend so much time talking about what they're going to do, because it's exciting. They see the possibilities, they imagine the future, and it's not, there's no builds, right? It's not a trap. What you get are you're selecting options, and then you have effort that you devote towards those options, which means that your decisions on what you're choosing to do matter. Mm -hmm. No. How's this sounding? What do you think? You saw the cover. You're the first person who's given me honest verbal feedback on the cover. You mm -hmm. like it? Yeah, it's cer <laughs> it certainly fits. It certainly fits that bit of weird that you're tr that you're trying to go for when depicting a interdimensional invasion. Trying trying to have that look like a stand, um, a lot of it's very it's a very it's a very surrealist affair. And if, yeah, which I, I, there's fits the um, subject matter. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I'm a game designer first, and a writer second, and an artist third. So, like, like part of the uh, problem with Sinless is that I'm doing it all. But part of the advantage of Sinless is that I'm doing it all. Like, <laughs> like when when the illustration gets done and it has to go out to the layout person, that's me. Like. <laughs> It smooths things. There's no waiting for stuff, which is one of the reasons why I've been able to produce so much high quality, high content. Uh, like, like there's just so much art. Like, literally hundreds of just gorgeous illustrations. Have you seen it? Have you seen some of the art? You have, haven't you? Yeah. What do you think of? It? Yeah, I have. And I've, I've, cer I've certainly enjoyed the, uh, the, appro the approach that it has. Um, 
and of, co of course, I've appreciated the bit of the bit of callback in the design. Um. Yeah. So I did. I did. Uh, you know, I'm not infringing on anyone's trade dress, but obviously, Shadowrun is an inspiration for my game. Let me look at the logo, right? Mm -hmm. But. Again, it's not Shadowrun. Uh, Shadowrun is a trad game where the DM has a story and the players go along with whatever the DM's providing them. Um, this isn't that. This is closer, I think, to an OSR-style game with Eurogame influences, right? I've already mentioned Ticket to Ride, but in general, um, it's not the rules that are complicated. The rules are very simple. Uh, you roll a d6, and if you get over the target number, it's a success. Everybody can do that. There's no addition or division. But the problem is, is that those dice are resources, right? Your 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 actions during the sector turn are resources, and so you have a large plethora of options given to you based off how you created your character. But in play, um, you're deciding all the time, deciding. And that is the favorite part of role-playing for me. It's not going through the eventual end of whatever tactical combat you're in or calculating how many hit points the guy has left or taking your turn. It's making interesting choices. And so I tried to eliminate the uninteresting choices. And there absolutely is a wonderful tactical uh, game in Sinless for win. Uh, very flexible too for not only when you're having armed conflicts but for when you need to escape like uh, I, I, I chase the action movies uh, spy movies they have chase scenes why are there no chase mechanics like chase is its own whole thing in sinless where it works exactly within the limited within the existing rules that already exist right it's just a mechanic for handling uh very specifically how people escape from pursuit in a way that not only allows for good decision making and success but also models failure you know like because this is a sandbox because it's not a trad game i don't assume anything like you could go in unprepared for a mission be blindsided by something that you weren't prepared for and have losses that isn't me hiding something from you that's you choosing which pieces of information to get and not choosing the right ones or being more focused on beating things up rather than gathering information. But then you're more likely to survive if you don't know something. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, the, the, the amount of time people spend thinking about what to do instead of how to do something, we've, we've pushed that 95-5. Nobody is asking, how do I? They are thinking in terms of what would I like to accomplish, right? They know how, they just need to figure out what. And I, that's so exciting for me. I, I know, I don't know if you sound excited, but it's exciting for me. Because that means in that 90 to 120 minutes, you're not, you're not figuring out how to play. You're making decisions about what you want to see happen. And you get to respond to the players. Because there's not... The, are you familiar with cognitive overhead? Yeah. Okay. So as a game designer, cognitive overhead is a huge thing. And I'm aware of it. And I designed a good game that manages cognitive overload real fucking well. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not... I, I, I decided that I didn't want to be a media person who... Not that there's anything wrong with a media person, but I'd already said it all. And then I wrote it in a book. No, I'm not going to tear apart other... Who knows if I'm talking out of my ass, right? I made it, So I made a game. Like, look at the game. It's so good. It's crazy. Like, I, I don't know. I could tell people that, and then they'll make their own decision, I guess. Uh, if, you, if you're if you concerned about the price, just join the Discord. Or, you know, look at the preview on DriveThruRPG. It's 190 pages. And if you're still on the fence, come talk to us. Like, it is, look at it. It's great. Yeah. But with, now, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for Billionaire Bounty? Not a date, per se, but a bulk. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. So, um, asset cards are going to the printer, uh, like, by tomorrow at pack one. And pack two should be about a week later. And, um, like I said, because I'm the artist and the layout person and the writer, um, the turnaround is, is pretty pretty good. Uh, we, we are looking for a PDF by October. And probably print four to six weeks after. I put December because I'm not stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I think 
I think in my head, early October. And so I know what that means is mid October. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, soon. (laughs) I want I want people to have it in their hands for the games this fall, because there's a gaming season, you know, it starts in the winter. Nobody, not as many people game in the summer. So I'd like one of the reasons we're running Kickstarter now is so it can be in hands for people's games when they go back to school or when work settles down after the end of the fiscal. And, you know, uh, I want it there for people. And so it'll be there. Mm-hmm. I, I can certainly get that. Um, the biggest the biggest hurdles um, have already been accomplished. At this point, it's an issue of design and layout. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can get. I can completely understand that issue. But yeah, yeah. No, I mean all the work's done. Yeah. Like you know, there's nothing in there that what what we're doing is is we're providing. And there's, I mean, I not all the work's done. I'm gonna have some fun making some new guns. Like I, we got we got some we got some enjoyable things, but that's not really work, right? I get to design a new firearm and think about how it. Uh, you know, gear is a huge part of cyberpunk games, mm-hmm. right? And and the problem with it is the cognitive overhead, right? And so we did two things to solve that. Uh, first of all, is that we have the uh, equipment, right? Um, very clearly modify the things you're already referencing and playing. And for the guns, yeah. we uh, have information cards for the guns. So each gun is individual and unique. It not only can be uh, upgraded, each gun has its own two unique upgrade paths, right? Um, They also have uh, a variety of modifications that can be applied to them. And the same goes true for drones and vehicles and whatever else. But all that information is contained on a quick reference card, and it all relates to the core gameplay loop. Like, uh, there's not, like, a mechanic we came up with that's not related to something else. It's all part of the same thing. So nobody's spending a lot of time flipping through the book because there's nothing in there. Mm-hmm. Unless you're doing character creation, right? Like, that's where all the rules are. That's not what they need. Everything they need is right in front of them. And it's not like a look at your character sheet to decide what to do type game, because there aren't builds. You can do a lot of different things. It really is, uh, when I say descriptive, not prescriptive, that's what I mean. It's a framework for allowing you to figure out how to resolve things, rather than a stringent list of rules that tells you what you must do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like... An example is during one of the play tests, one of the players wanted to, they have a, they had a, some housing, they wanted to upgrade it to condos. Why did they want to upgrade the housing to condos? Well, because they had some factories in the area that make more money if there are condos nearby instead of housing. The problem is, is that there's poor people living in the housing right now. And so they were like, well, well, we want to smash that down to build condos. I said, well, what are you going to do about the poor people? And they're like, uh, because I was like, if you smash them, they're just going to be homeless, right? And again, that's an example of how fallout can affect the sector, right? If they decide to demolish that, there's a bunch of homeless people around, the heat in the sector is going to go up. It's going to affect other things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And they were like, well, look, we have living expenses. So they just paid the living expenses for all the people in the building until they upgraded to a condo. And then I was like, well, where are they going to live? And they're like, we'll put them back in the condo. I said, they can't afford it. And I said, well, we'll just make less money on the condo. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And then they're willing to do that, but actual landlords in the real world aren't. I, I, I mean, this is kind of the thing. It puts them in the situation. It would have been much more affordable for them just to, you know, uh, gentrify the people in that apartment. They paid that cost. You know what I'm saying? They're not being as efficient as they could have because of morality. It's it's interesting, is what I'm saying, is that all the decisions are interesting and fun. Yeah. Not in an interesting, like, you got to do a bunch of hard work, but interesting in, like, well, you're going to make a decision, and it's going to have a consequence. Maybe if you're into, you know, the JRPG style of being a hero that never loses or whatever, it's not for you. Because this is, this is a game where you can fail. It's expected that people sometimes might not succeed. Um, with that said, I do want to sincerely <laughs> thank you once again for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. And oh, no, it's it's great. It's good to talk to you again. I think what you're doing is super important. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to support it. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. 
I, every every time I have a product, like I I'm an, I'm not a capitalist. I'm anti cap. I'm a minimalist myself. Like I own three pairs of clothing, three pants, three shirts, and an overshirt. Like I'm not into material wealth or accumulation of goods or even money. Is a it's made up. We made it up. Like it doesn't exist. It's it's a decision. It's not a natural law we just decided that it's a good way and so when somebody keeps all of it they're just deciding to be uh immoral right um so like i i don't want to have to i don't want to have to live in the world or do a capitalism but guys i like food also i read the best game you'll ever read so buy it that's like we can work together <laughs> um regard regard regardless <laughs> a, also a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay fucking frosty everybody <laughs> <laughs>